Hello, Facebook friends. Hello, friends of Redeemer Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Greg, pastor of Redeemer Lutheran in Fircrest, Washington. And it is time for our Thursday afternoon Bible study. This is a study in which we look at the upcoming lessons for this Sunday. Um, and uh, today, specifically, we'll be looking at Mark chapter 13 and Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, today, I'm, I'm pre-recording our uh, study uh, just because we had, uh, well, we had originally planned, I had originally planned to be out of town, actually, helping my mom to move. Uh, sadly, uh, I had to uh, cancel those plans. Our, um, our uh, eight-year-old lab took a sudden turn, uh, uh, became very ill with an infection, and, um, and we had to put her to sleep. But so that took, that took the place of my trip to uh, Great Falls. So appreciate your thoughts and your prayers. We, many of you know how that it's hard when you lose a, a beloved pet, and Shyla certainly was. Um, sweet, sweet, sweet girl. But um, so thank you for those prayers. Uh, today is um, a Veterans Day, and we are, are grateful, uh, thankful for our veterans who, uh, so many of them who sacrificed themselves, lives, and and um, and um, but gave of themselves on on battlefields for our sake, or to serve and serve time just uh, in our defense. Our, we're grateful for all that they've done, and uh, those that supported them their families. Um, I, I will be uh, a guest preacher this Sunday at, at um, St. John's Lutheran, and so we, um, uh, uh, Pastor Diana will be um, preaching um, at uh, Redeemer, but uh, in any case, she'll still be um, looking at these lessons, especially Mark chapter 13 and Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, let's oh, uh, say a prayer, and uh, we'll go on from there. I think I had some other announcements, but um, suddenly they slipped my mind. Lord Jesus, we thank you again for uh, this time to look into your, your scripture. Uh, thank you for um, reminding us to stay focused on you, uh, not to become uh, full of fear and always looking down the path of what's going to happen, but to, to remind ourselves that whatever happens, good, bad, whatever it might be, that in fact we we are in your we are in your presence we are we are grasped by your love uh, we have a destiny that is secure in you so that we can deal with these things as they as they happen as they come and go we can treasure um, the loves that come into our life and um, we ask you Lord to uh, to continue to give us comfort and assurance and healing for the nations uh, as we as uh, we get over this pandemic. We pray, Lord, that there can be less division and polarization. We pray for a greater peace. And we ask, Lord, to be that vessel, to be, to be those preachers of your peace in your world and in your name. Amen. So um, let's start by having a look there at Mark chapter 13. And um, we've been uh, kind of following along Jesus, Jesus and his ministry in uh, Mark's gospel. And this is drawing toward uh, the time where not long after this in, uh, the, in, in Mark's gospel, will Jesus will be betrayed and, and will um, end up um, being killed on the cross uh, before his resurrection. In any case, um, as far as the church year goes, as we're, we'll be hitting into Advent, which is the beginning of the church year, uh, come the end of this month. Um, and so this, uh, this is actually the last Sunday that we'll have from uh, the way they do the, the, the Bible lessons that will be in Mark's gospel. Uh, next Sunday, we'll be looking, I believe, at, at John's gospel. Um, the scene is uh, here in this beginning of, of Mark 13. Here they are in Jerusalem. And, and for some of these disciples who are coming from other outlying towns, the, these visits to Jerusalem, the big city, it, it's, it's, it's amazing, it's marvelous. And so, of course, whenever you, you go to the big city, when we, when we go up to Seattle and, and see the buildings, it's like, wow, our heads are up. And I'm like, wow. 
And that's kind of the scene here is that um, it's just a simple remark that a disciple throws out and then Jesus takes it in a, in a different direction. I think it's helpful to, to realize that when Mark sits down to write his gospel, uh, they think about 60 AD or so, um, 60, 70, uh, tensions between the Jews and the Roman, Romans is, is growing rapidly. And it's, it's, this isn't long before, um, there is a, there's an uprising and, and in fact, the temple is destroyed. Some think that this, anyway, that Mark is reflecting on those growing tensions and remembering or writing, well, he, he um, investigated and writing down some of this, this, this memory that the disciples had of Jesus. In any case, they come out of the temple and one of the disciples, we don't know who, uh, this is uh, verse one, by the way, chapter 13, verse one. One of the disciples said to Jesus, look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings they have. And um, just to be amazed, just like we are sometimes when we see the old buildings, we wonder how did they stack one upon another? What did it take? What kind of effort? It is amazing what they were able to do. But Jesus says, Jesus asked, asked him, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. And it's, he, he said that more in that just to the, the disciples in general. So there might have been a big group of them. Because in verse 3, it says, When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, those four, came up and asked him privately, Tell us, tell us when this will be accomplished. Tell us. When this will be accomplished. Um, what it suggests is that, that, okay, in recalling this time with Jesus and knowing the tensions of when this gospel is being written down, by now the temple has been threatened, probably, if not worse. Um, and of course, you, you want to say, well, what's, what's this all leading to? When, when is this going to happen? And that is, of course, questions that arise still today. When will, when will it all end? Is this, is this near the end? Are we seeing, when will we see these things? And let us know the day, the time, so we can prepare for it. But verse 5, Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am. Our texts often say, I am he, but the Greek is, they will say, I'm the one, I am he, and they will lead many astray. Um, in this whole thing, it's like, I think that it's important to realize one of the things that's being suggested here, that not even the disciples, not even the disciples were given um, in confidence, were, had that information given to them revealed to them. So if, if the disciples, if those followers of Jesus, were, if it wasn't even revealed to them, it's maybe not information that, that we are meant to discover or glean or, or figure out in, in the inscriptions. And you know how people try to calculate. <laughs> Where's the mystery in this? I don't think Jesus is trying to lay out a mystery to be solved. Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he. Now, I think that the other thing to lift up here is Jesus, especially in John's gospel, says, I am a lot. He, I am the culmination. Don't, don't be looking down the road. Don't be looking, don't be led by someone who comes after me, even in my name, to try to say, I'm the one. I'm, I'm the, I am the culmination. No, Jesus, Jesus was the culmination of time. Okay, we keep thinking the culmination of time is yet to come and yet to come. Our culmination as Christians was in, in Jesus coming to earth, ministering, suffering, dying, and being raised. That's our culmination. We don't need to be looking down the road, but rather looking back to Jesus and what he did. And Jesus goes on, verse 7, when, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't be alarmed. It doesn't mean be unaffected, but, but don't get wrapped up into it, thinking, oh, here comes the war, this is the end. When you hear wars and rumors of wars, do not alarm. This must take place. 
I think he's saying the fact is they happen, but the end that you're talking about is still to come after that. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. So again, I think that Jesus is kind of saying the culmination happened with him. These things, as, as again, as Mark is writing his gospel, these, these things are happening around. And in some ways, Mark wanted to relay to his community, hey, Jesus addressed this issue. These don't necessarily refer to the end coming. But that these happen. This is, they are part of the reason Jesus came to earth. To provide a sense of assurance in the midst of all of this. but the end is still to come. These days, the things that we go through, I think that, I think that our pandemics and, and um, the pandemic and the things that we, we are going through, it does certainly show us and reveal the fragility of life. That life, that life, has, life is breakable and it is fragile and things can happen and nations can totter and fall. There, the, the, that our anxieties are based on real things and there will be d divisions. But, but when we start saying, well, this must be the end, it's like, not likely. Not that, no, and, and regardless, the end isn't the culmination. The end isn't what we are looking toward and, and practically worshiping. If we do that, I, I think that I feel like when Christian groups get so wrapped up in the end time, they almost make it into a kind of idol, a deity, replacing Jesus Christ and what he did already. He is our salvation and what he did was our salvation. The end isn't our salvation. The end may be the complete revelation of a salvation, but our salvation happened with Jesus Christ on the cross. Woo. I didn't mean to go into a whole sermon there, but um, it's um, it actually ends up being a powerful message when Jesus is what I think Jesus is saying, and I think that Hebrews, if you don't mind chap turning to uh, Hebrews chapter ten, kind of helps build on that uh, and and really bring it out. Hebrews chapter ten, our verses we'll be looking at are actually verses eleven through fourteen. We'll, we'll jump a little bit over 15 through 18, 11 through 14, and 19 through 25. And with Hebrews, we haven't been following that too much, but Hebrews spends a lot of time uh, describing Jesus as our great high priest, the greatest, highest priest, and the sacrificial lamb, both the priest and the lamb. And in a way, Hebrews is really trying to show how it is that Jesus is, is our salvation, our, our freedom from sin, um, and why it is that we can now have a sense of boldness is, is a word even used, that we can approach God's throne with a sense of assurance, assurance at least. Yes, there's still the fear of the Lord. There's still this awe oh, and he is mighty God, but also knowing that we can do this, we can have we can tr we can do this trusting his love because of who we saw in Jesus. And, and so now um, I, I think in uh, the author is trying to show us why we can, uh, why it is that Jesus is the answer, the answer to the human need. Anyway, verse 11, uh, Hebrews 10, verse 11. And he's talking about the, 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 the sacrificial, um, because the Jews, of course, why, why do we need Jesus? We have this temple. We have temple. We have lambs to sacrifice. And what is it about Jesus that, um, that, that uh, you're sugge you Christians suggest we need? And um, he's, he's, he says, every high priest, verse 11, every, every priest, every priest stands day after day at his service. It has to be done over and over again. Uh, it's never f done because we're never done sinning, <laughs> okay? Day, he spends day after day at a service offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. Uh, I mean, because w the moment you take away sins, there's still sin. It never, it, it never finishes. It needs, needs rivers of blood, rivers of blood. Verse 12, but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins. He then sat down at the right hand of God, suggesting it was done. 
Christ, because Christ did it once for all, it doesn't need to be done over and over again. And he sits down at the right hand of God to say, there, it's done. And, and with Christ holding within him humanity, he is both divine and human, because Christ is divine and human, it is also his humanity that sits down next at the right hand of God, representing ours, that, that it's done, it has been done for us. And verse 13, and since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. So there is an already not yet. Yes, this still has to play out. There is still, the enemy is still out there. The enemy that causes sin, the enemy that causes death and disease. That's, we are waiting for the full culmination, but the sacrifice has been done. We don't need any more. Verse 14, for by a single offering, he perfected, I'm going to look at that word in a second. He, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Actually, the, the, the grammar would be those who are being sanctified. That's us. We are being sanctified all the time. Um, sanctified means set apart. Uh, it, it suggests a sense of holiness for God's purposes that we are, we are being, we are always being kind of separated out from the crowd in order to do the works that God intended for us. Um, but at the same time, it says we've, we've been perfected. Okay. For by a single offering, he has perfected. Now the word perfect, we often ascribe a moral value to that. That to be perfect means you, that you have not sinned. Um, the, the Greek word that's used there is actually finished. He has finished. So th that actually kind of suggests it's not about being perfect in the sense that you never sin. It's that you have, um, you've been, <laughs> the God's goal for you has been complete in Christ. Christ completed God's goal for us through forgiveness. Okay. Um, it's not, we're not perfected in the sense of not sinning, but perfected in that our sin has been removed or forgiven. Our sin having been removed or forgiven allows us to continue in this process of sanctification, being set apart as his people. Do we continue to sin? Of course. So this is, this is a flowing thing, both saint and sinner, we Lutherans like to say, that, that our, our forgiveness even though, even though we are in the midst of our sin, our forgiveness has been removed through Christ's sacrifice once for all time, for all of it, and um, removed and forgiven. Uh, then jump to verse 19. Therefore, with all this in mind, therefore, my friends, since we have confidence I mean, because of this and because God did it for us through Christ, that God in Christ did this. We can trust that it's done because God did it. Since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary, the presence of God by the blood of Jesus, his blood, not ours, not sheep's. By the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain of his flesh, meaning he, having given him his flesh, and he is the way. Often we talk about the narrow path. The narrow path is as narrow and wide as Jesus' grace and mercy. As narrow as Jesus, but that is wide open because of his grace and mercy. He opened to us through the curtain his flesh. And since we have a great high priest, we have a great priest over the house of God, since that's our priest and since he's the one that loves us and shown us the love of God, verse 22, let us approach with a true and open heart, full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. We don't have to be burdened by our guilt. <laughs> sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed if our bodies have been involved in sin, that the, that the pure water of baptism, whether it's sprinkled on our head or full immersion, doesn't matter. It's that it, it was God that did it, washed with the pure water, holy water of God. Let us hold fast. Let us hold fast because we can hold on to this thing. Hold, hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. We can trust it. 
And the confession of our hope isn't just me saying, oh, I have sinned and dear, dear Lord, please forgive me. The confession of my hope is, is, the, is the proclamation that I trust Jesus for my, my life and my salvation. Just being able to say, I can hold on to Jesus. That is a confession of hope. Without wavering, for he who has promised us, he, for he who has promised is faithful. We can do this not because I'm faithful, not because I'm good, not because I did something to, to, I prayed the right prayer or whatever. I can hold on to it because the one who promised Jesus, he's faithful because he's, it's dependent upon his faith. And let us consider now, and in response again, verse 24, let's consider how to provoke one another. I love that. And I looked it up and sure enough, the Greek word there is usually kind of poke, you know, stop provoking your sister. <laughs> stop provoke, you know, don't provoke me. It's usually used in this negative sense. And that's true in the Greek world too, when, in the, when this was written. But it kind of is also a word to, to kind of prod, keep moving. You know, you would provoke, you prod, the cattle prod, okay? Provoke one another to love. Keep insisting to each other, us brothers and sisters, keep insisting that we are called to show Christ's love. Provoke one another to the love and good deeds. Yes, the good deeds don't save us. We've already been saved, but having been saved now, we can, we can do these good deeds because we're not trying to save ourselves. It's not selfish. It's for God. It's for love. Let's consider how to provoke one another to the love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together. Okay, we had to stay apart during COVID. And, and, and I know that some people with, with, that we all, we do need to continue to be careful and being careful though that we can come together. Now, even during the midst of COVID, we came together many times, uh, whether it was through video or, or um, through a live broadcast like this, we are coming together. We are, we are, <laughs> I, get, I get it that we're separated by space and time, but on the other hand, we need to continue to come together, and that's why we tried to make these ways. We didn't simply just close the church door. That we, we had to find ways to be the body scattered, coming together through the means, these amazing means that we have. Not, do not neglect to meet together, as is the habit of some, and, and we got to get out of that habit if it has been our habit but encouraging one another, not just out of yeah, some provocation, but encouraging and, and, and reminding each other this is, this is helpful and valuable. Encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, again, we don't know when that's coming. We do know it's coming. It's not the reason we do our things, but just to remind each other, you know what? Some, this will be all resolved and we will be all together. That will happen someday. But in the meantime, in the meantime, these are the things that we need to do. Provoke each other to, to love and, and our good deeds as a body. Don't neglect to meet together, to find ways to meet together and encourage one another. Amen to that, brothers and sisters. I hope you are well. Um, see you soon. Uh, if not uh, next week, at least next week, one o'clock for our Thursday Bible study. Um, join us if you're able to, 930 on Sundays in person or live. And, uh, and um, God bless you all. Bye-bye.